people to see who you are, um, where you're zooming in from. Hi to Young Jun Kim. I recall you being at the board meeting, at the YAA board meeting, and we sat together and you mentioned how much you enjoy these things, sometimes based in Seoul, Korea, uh, sometimes in New York, where you are now. So really good to see you and looking forward to seeing you at the board meeting. Um, and hi to Norman from YDS, class of 89, interested in the connection between faith and environmental care. And it's always interesting also to see the sort of intersections of different disciplines that we bring together to talk about climate change. So I appreciate all of you all sharing your introductions. Please do keep them coming. Uh, we will be sharing the chat with Professor Manning after the presentation is over so that he has a chance to um, read all the, uh, the introductions that we may have missed. In the meantime, I'm going to get us started with um, an introduction of Professor Manning. He grew up in Western Springs, Illinois, and received his MA and PhD from the University of Chicago. Most of his early work was within a framework that he terms analytical humanities, and that's about establishing a, an historical framework for Greco-Roman periods in Egypt, in which documentary papyri, written in Greek and Egyptian, can be interpreted. Uh, with that as a technical base, his earlier work was done in Hellenistic Mediterranean economic history with a focus on Ptolemaic Egypt. And he is now working with an even broader historical scope, examining climate change at various scales and global societal responses on both micro and macro scales. His goal is to understand complexity rather than to simplify and he outlines this philosophy, including the necessity of working in teams in the first chapter of his latest book, The Open Sea, published by Princeton University Press in 2018. He's currently working on a book dealing with human history and climate change over the last 10,000 years. This is expected to hit the shelves in 2023. You can be sure we will be back bringing you Professor Manning again to promote his new book and give a uh, book talk to our Yale Alumni Academy audience when that happens. And you can learn more about Professor Manning by visiting mm -hmm. alumniacademy.yale.edu. If you have questions during our presentation today, please do put them in the Q&A box and not in the chat. It's hard to keep track of the questions in the chat. It's easy to keep track of them and make sure we get to your question if you put it in the Q&A box. And as a reminder, our climate change conversation series began last week and it ends this week. This is the third presentation in the series and there is one more to come. So please do visit our alumniacademy.yale.edu website to make sure that you're signed up for the next presentation as well. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Professor Manning. Well, thanks very much, Lauren. And hello, everybody. I'm grateful for your presence uh, wherever you are in the world. Let me get started by fumbling into sharing my screen, if I can do that. Um, and already not seeing this. There it is. You would think we would get used to this after all the Zooms we have done. Um, if we were going on a, an alumni tour, um, these are the places I would, I would take you, um, which would be a really long trip. Uh, so, um, this is a little bit easier just to orient us the Katmai National Park in Alaska. The Nile River in Egypt. Reno, Nevada, of all places, I'll explain. The Euphrates River. Greenland. And finally, ending up back in Alaska in the Aleutian Islands at a place perhaps not so well-known, Mount Okmuk on Omnak Island. All right. With that as an orientation, let me get out of that. Let me share my PowerPoint slides and we'll get going.
and I'm really looking forward to um, a conversation at the end. This is, as Lauren said, uh, uh, the talk is really the first time I've spoken publicly about my book project, which is climate and history together over the last 10,000 years. And this is the preliminary title of the book, Subject to Change. Um, and obviously I'm gonna cover a very thin sliver of some issues I think that arise with climate and history together. Uh, I guess the big question is, does history matter? Uh, this is one of the questions I'm answering um, in this um, book project. So for the next 45 minutes or so, something like that, I want to run through some slides and then we'll open up to, to, to um, conversation. We're living in uh, the Anthropocene era aside, we're living in officially what is called by geophysicists and geologists, um, the Holocene, the last 10,000 years since the last ice age, um, which is generally considered a rather boring period. Um, here we are, um, you notice, uh, temperature variation, not so great in the last 10,000 years, not so great in comparison to the very chaotic exit out of the last ice age where there were quite wild swings, um, which remind us that temperature and climate states can actually swing uh, pretty dramatically um, back and forth. But in comparison, we're living in the last uh, 10,000 years in a quiet period the Holocene, it's the period when agriculture gets started and of course the period in which civilization uh, arises and it's a period we are still um, living in. Um, so that's the period uh, of the book. It's a period of my a topic and what I wanna show in a couple of illustrations really is even though the Holocene is relatively quiet in terms of climate variability. There's significant variability that's worth studying. I think it informs current day circumstances um, to some extent, which we can which we can talk about. Um, but the old idea that the Holocene is really boring, not really worth studying, I think is not um, not correct. My book project and my current work, the work over the last um, seven or eight years is deriving from a project funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation based here at Yale that I call the Yale Nile Initiative. It is a team effort as these things have to be. And this is some of the team in Dublin, which is a place we um, often meet uh, from left to right. Um, Allegra Legrand, who's um, a, a leading climate modeler at NASA GIS in New York. Jen Marlin, the School of the Environment here at Yale, who's a paleoclimatologist. Um, a former Yale college student, Nadia Grisaru, who uh, was our administrative whiz, and we miss her. Um, and then to my um, left, Michael Siegel, who is an ice core geochemist in Bern in Switzerland now. Um, and my good friend, Francis Ludlow, um, based at Trinity Colin College Dublin, who's uh, by training a medieval climate historian, but a superb general climate historian. So that's the basis of um, my own thinking, um, which is how I'm writing this book, actually, my experience is working in this very challenging world of understanding um, climate and climate data, climate sciences, plural, um, and history, and bringing these two things together, which is actually extraordinarily challenging um, and uh, presents um, a lot of difficulties. And we can talk about that in question time a little bit, a little bit more. It does take me into some rather strange places for someone who is an ancient historian centered in the Eastern Mediterranean, primarily with Egyptian material because it's such good documentation for economic history. Um, on the right is the Desert Research Institute in Reno, Nevada. So that's why we have to go to Reno. Um, and that's Omnac Island on the top left there. Uh, mid Aleutian Island. It looks rather volcanic uh, because it is with an ex extraordinary eruption history, which we can now study in some detail. And Greenland, uh, very important for ice core geochemistry research, of course, um, in a place I've taken my graduate students um, a couple of summers ago. Again, a little bit unusual for an ancient historian of the Mediterranean to go to these places, but that is the change um, in the field. It requires this kind of, this kind of work. Now, paleoclimatology as a, as a series of uh, disciplines, really a set of disciplines, um, is not so new. Um, it goes back, um, arguably, uh, in some ways, more than a century. 
but it has changed dramatically in the last um, decade, even in the last five years, because of the vast number of what are called paleoclimate proxy records coming from all kinds of uh, natural places um, in the earth, ice cores um, in the polar regions, pack rat middens, you see here corals in the oceans, marine uh, core sediment, sediment cores from lakes, from the oceans, um, speleothem records, uh, st cave stalagmites or stalactites in caves around the world from pollen records, um, just to give you a, a sampling of what are now many dozens of natural records, which tell us something about the history of Earth's climate, increasingly further back in the past um, with higher resolution, that is more accurate um, dating um, records, which is a serious revolution uh, in the last handful of years, which is why we can we can recreate temperature record of the Earth back now something like 800,000 years um, and with um, other kinds of records, certainly the full Holocene now, the last 10,000 years with increasing accuracy. So it's really exciting, I think, um, even for someone like me, an historian who wants to understand how does climate make a difference in human um, societies in the past in, in various ways. We couldn't really study this accurately um, at all, very fuzzy sorts of relationships, and uh, again, until very recently, um, whereas now, with the kind of work we're doing on the Yale Project, um, we have even sub-annual records. So um, time scale is really important for this kind of work, for understanding the relationships, the intimate relationships between human societies and environments and environmental change at very different scales, some of them not perceptible to humans, scales of many tens of thousands of years, but now down to sub-annual records, that is under a year um, kinds of climatic change that we, we can actually observe um, in the historical record. And as I think I'm hoping to convince you, we can tie that with historical records from places like Egypt, where we have a density of historical records and we, we can actually see human responses um, year by year. Um, and that is new, I think, um, and really exciting. We can understand historical processes um, to some extent better. We can understand them now dynamically. Um, and we can understand, indeed, the complexities of human environment interactions. And they are, to be sure, really complicated. And by the way, just to pitch to geophysicists in the audience, uh, it, it, it's a science sciences that I greatly admire um, nowadays, have fallen in love with. Um, and geophysicists are actually superb historians, which is why you know I hang a lot a, a, hang out a lot up at steep and on Science Hill these days, um, because serious history um, goes on there um, at a different time scale than I used to work, of course with annual historical records, even dated to the day and the month, of course. But this is there's a convergence now between geophysical records and human historical records, which is really, um, it's I think, truly impossible to, to um, ignore. So we can combine the, the rather thin record of, of instrumental observation over the last 100, 150 years um, with historical reconstructions of temperature and precipitation um, patterns. Um, yes, indirect. Yes, with some um, um, margin of error um, to some extent. The further back in time, the, the more that is, which we understand, I think, pretty well now, nowadays. But uh, reasonably, reasonably decent records, pretty deep into the past. Um, and by the way, we often see this. We're, we are historians. This is the historical nerd in me. We often see this in. Uh, climate records a year zero. We're getting rid of that slowly, but there is no year zero. Of course, it's BC1 and then AD1, of course. But we can go now pretty far back with, with climate proxy records with, I think, rather stunning, um, rather stunning accuracy. Now, the historical problem, and it is it is still with us, um, as I'll show in one of my last slides, it's often interpreted the kind of work you do with bringing scientific data. Um, I should mention also the history of disease with paleogenomics, which is an extraordinarily interesting science. 
um, is um, this this uh, horrible thing we call climate determinism, which goes back uh, a century um, and actually goes back to antiquity with classical authors like Herodotus, that the relationship between environments and climatic change and human societies um, is direct. Climate drives uh, human societal responses. That is, that's it in this rather linear way. And this is something that the very famous Yale geographer, Ellsworth Huntington, is kind of notorious for. He was a very interesting geographer, um, but um, foundationally, he was a climate determinist, that, that is, climate and environments determine human societies and directly human responses. And that is not, in fact, how we work um, these days for a variety of reasons, including the climate proxy records, which didn't exist uh, un until a few years ago, which really changes the game and makes things way more complex. So now how we work, which is unusual for historians too, but this is how we have to do it, um, in what's called human natural system dynamics. And, and the natural system and the human systems, even in antiquity, um, are coupled um, with feedbacks in both directions. And so on the left, just a notional idea of how complicated um, we have to think about the interactions of the natural system, the earth climate system, and human systems um, around the world, which are obviously um, different in one place to the next. So just to give you an idea of that compared to a linear model, um, th the game has changed completely, but that makes it much harder to do the work, of course, and it makes it a challenge to kind of write up the results. Um, that's sort of the cutting edge of this sort of um, this sort of work. We speak of climate sensitivity these days, mainly when we're talking about current issues uh, around warming and how sensitive is Earth's climate to, let's say, doubling of CO2 concentrations. That's what we mean often by climate sensitivity. But there's also the challenge of historical sensitivity. How sensitive was a particular society? to a particular kind of climate change at a certain scale uh, over thousands of years or over centuries or a climate shock of a single year or even a single season. Again, that's a, that is a simple question uh, that provokes extraordinary <laughs> complicated um, answers, even if we can answer them. But this is sort of what we're trying to, trying to do in the NOW project and other projects um, around the world. Now, the, the beauty of working um, on the Nile River uh, and um, the, the Egyptian Nile um, in particular is um, that we have historical records pretty far back in time. This is an extraordinary river. The ancients thought so too. It's an extraordinarily complicated climatic system with two basic drivers, the White Nile region around Lake Victoria and uh, the Lake Tana region in the Ethiopian highlands, very different climate systems actually that come together to drive the annual flood of the river uh, when the Nile used to flood, um, which is the lifeblood of Egyptian civilization to be sure, and other, other uh, civilizations around um, the Nile River um, system. It's an extraordinary place that we can study now in some detail and we can combine in a case study um, historical records and climate records, I think, in, in rather um, interesting ways and, and in rather surprising ways. I don't know if anybody, I'd like to hear if anyone has been to um, the Katmai National Park or to Mount Katmai. Here it is, this beautiful mountain just under 7,000 um, feet that is a, a dormant um, volcano um, that um, is the source of the largest volcanic eruption in the 20th century, um, in 1912, actually not technically the source, we now know Mount Katmai didn't erupt, but a new fissure near Mount Katmai um, erupted in 1912 in an area where no one lived. So it's very little described actually, um, but we do have amazing historical records, photographic records of Kodiak Island off the coast of the Katmai Peninsula here, a hundred miles from the eruption um, where um, the ash fall was really significant. Uh, and, the, and these are coming from the National Geographic, a wonderful article in late 1912 of the impact of that eruption on habited islands um, nearby, which was extraordinary. It was a very large eruption um, indeed. Um, and um, described in a letter that we have at the Beinecke Library here, which is unpublished, um, which is an extraordinary eyewitness description um, from Afognik on the island, island, small island just north of Kodiak Island, 
of a, a native Alaskan woman writing to a school teacher who used to teach on the island. Um, she's living in Boston and writes a letter describing the ash fall and the catastrophe that, that was being faced by islanders for uh, unknown reasons um, at, at the time. But it, it's an extraordinary, detailed, wonderful letter um, that I'm hoping to talk more about um, in, in the book project. Kind of an eyewitness account. I'm a bit like Pliny um, describing the eruption of Vesuvius, actually, um, in, in AD 79. So here's a kind of a, a wonderful um, equivalent, I think, in some ways, of this larger um, eruption. Now, um, what's extraordinary about it is kind of the science already by this person. Again, little known um, in most circles, but he should be better known. Charles Greeley Abbott, an extraordinary scientist um, who later was the director of the Smithsonian for something like 40 years. But in 1912, he's in Algeria running um, the Smithsonian um, Astrophysical Observatory. This is, he was a scientist interested in studying solar, the solar constant, which is not, we know now, not a constant. It's that there actually is small variability, which is to some extent, uh, an important climate driver um, in the Earth's system. And he was in Algeria studying um, this phenomena with instruments that he invented and built himself at this kind of makeshift observatory. Here he is in this wonderful photograph from 1913. Um, and he noticed uh, on the horizon, a dark smoke. And he thought it was a fire of some kind, but he remembered reading a short notice, must have been the New York Times, I have these clippings of, an, er an eruption in the Alaskan interior, which is making all sorts of ashfall um, around the world. And eventually, apparently later that day, he tells us in his diary, he gets the idea that perhaps this is this eruption in the Alaskan interior. If so, it must be a really large eruption. And he decides to make temperature observations, both uh, in Algeria, but in fact, around the world, he writes friends saying, at other observatories, including Los Angeles, uh, please make temperature observations for the next um, six months and observations of uh, solar radiation variability. And, th and it's recorded and published in National Geographic later in, um, later in the year in, in an amazing article, Do Volcanic Eruptions Affect Climate? Um, amazing because this was not confirmed until uh, instrumental observations and climate modeling um, in 2006 and uh, through about 2008. But in 1912, he makes this hunch that turns out to be um, right. What he didn't observe, what he didn't fully understand was the Katmai eruption, the largest eruption of the 20th century, um, perturbs the monsoon regions the, around the world in very interesting um, ways, which we now understand. This as a freshman in college would bring nightmares in, uh, to me um, in my chemistry class, but now I sort of love this stuff and I won't really explain it, but we now understand what's called a teleconnection between large volcanic eruptions that inject sulfates into the stratosphere, which circulate at least hemispherically, if not globally, sulfate particles reflect solar radi radiation back into space. It cools the earth's surface and that's the the physical mechanism, which in fact we know um, perturbs um, monsoon regions um, around the world. And we know in 1913 now, because of British observations, um, that the Nile was at its lowest flow in a century, um, really um, either side of, of that eruption. So it has very dramatic effects, not just of the Nile River, but um, around the world in monsoon dependent um, regions. So that teleconnection which Abbott was kind of at the beginning of understanding, we can now show uh, with our work, um, but with scientific observations and climate modeling, it's absolutely clear now um, that eruptions, large scale ones, are the single most important driver of annual variability um, of climate. So pretty spectacular stuff. And we know that thanks to Joe McConnell's um, laboratory uh, in Reno, Nevada, here's the, the lab bench, um, which is extraordinary um, by itself. But this is a great example of climate proxy records and the kind of work that's being done at considerable um, detail, mainly in Greenland um, and the Antarctic, where ice core scientists um, spend several months in relatively 
harsh conditions actually um, these days, drilling cores down pretty deep. Um, and uh, the ice cores preserve annual layers, not just of eruptions that um, uh, that end up the sulfates precipitated out with snowfall um, every year, but other kinds of climate data. Um, and it, it gets preserved in layers, which can now be analyzed chemically um, in labs um, with this amazing instrumentation. This, this is Joe McConnell's lab, who's a Yaley, by the way, um, uh, with two of these inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometers, which I think come out of originally medical research, but are now used in climate research. Um, and these measure the presence of isotopes in the parts per quadrillion now, um, which is why we get very high resolution climate data. Um, it's pretty amazing um, stuff. And I, I take my graduate students to Reno now. I spend a lot of time in this lab. Here's Joe McConnell with his um, uh, brilliant postdoc um, at, at the bottom there. Um, cutting ice cores, and then the third room in the lab is um, analyzing in real time the output from the ICPMSs um, that are that can measure all sorts of interesting things, not just volcanic eruptions um, and therefore impact of eruptions on things like uh, monsoon areas. More on that in a second, um, but other kinds of observations um, as well. It's it's really great science. It's wonderful um, to see, and Joe McConnell happily is, uh, I think, the leading ice core geochemist in the world, interested in science. And he almost became an archaeologist at Yale, but he stuck to science, I think, thank goodness for all of us. Um, but he's very open to doing historical work, um, and it's just a, a lot of fun. Um, just really quickly on climate change scales, um, the challenge is to understand different scales of climate change. And sometimes these um, interact together, um, which is a, a serious challenge. So on one hand, climate change is caused by what we call orbital forcing because the Earth has a wobble in it and it's not a perfectly round rotation around um, the sun. So between 20 and 100,000 years, um, there are these variations in solar radiation hitting the surface of the Earth, which generates things like ice ages, of course, and other kinds of phenomena um, that are uh, kind of the macro drivers of the Earth's climate um, system these things known as Milankovitch cycles after this brilliant physicist um, who, who discovered these, these observations. So on one hand, there are these orbital forcing scales that are climate drivers um, that are obviously not observable to humans, but I think we understand them um, pretty well now. And that orbital forcing, the rain here, or sorry, the red here is the monsoon rainfall around the world um, in the what's called intertropical convergence zone, um, which migrates northward every summer for geophysical reasons that are well understood. I think um, no, it won't detain us here, but I think it's pretty well understood. Um, the solar radiation budgets hitting the earth is the main driver really of this, which is why we get monsoon seasons in places like East Africa, the driver of the Nile River flood, South Asia, East Asia, and so on. The orbital forcing will change the energy budgets um, that's that in the earth, which affects um, the monsoon kind of fundamentally, which is why, for example, um, we have a transition after 6000 BC from a green Sahara and these massive lakes in the Sahara to a desert Sahara now. That's caused by a, a shift southward of the ITCZ because of orbital forcing. It's a famous example of that. And this is well studied now archaeologically um, in the Sahara. So we go from a lot of settlements um, before then, um, the last ice age um, to uh, settlements in the Green Sahara when it was very rich fauna um, area with a lot of cattle herding and so on. And then by um, the fourth millennium BC, again, human movement back um, into that now river valley, um, bringing things like this extensive cattle herding culture into Egypt, um, which is the basis of ancient Egyptian civilization. So that fundamental orbital forcing and large scale over over a couple thousand years at least um, movement of people and animals into the Nile River Valley or back into it I should say is a driver of human civilization in one of the world's first um, civilizations. We also know that um, there are centennial scale um, events like drought patterns around the world that have been um, well studied as a result of um, a lot of work including by Harvey Weiss um, here at Yale one of the one of the godfathers of understanding um, the phenomenon of mega droughts, droughts patterns over 
um, a couple of centuries, um, for example. Um, just a quick slide about volcanic eruptions. Um, thankfully, when we had a space shuttle, we can we can understand and we get great photographs of before and after. This is Pinatubo. Some of you will remember this eruption in the Philippines in 1991. It's the last eruption we've had in the world that's affected the global climate system. So it's been a while. And you can see kind of the before and after shot of the stratosphere with uh, sulfates um, injected in, which is why we get solar radiation um, impacting it, impacting things. And we can match that kind of thing up um, on kind of fine scales now and on scales of decades um, and centuries um, in our work in the Nile project um, by looking at, uh, this is a way of understanding volcanic eruptions and how we measure them in solar radiation reduction in watts per square meter and actually fairly fine am amounts of reduction. I think New Haven today, a sunny day here, would get something like 1300 watts per square meter of solar radiation hitting um, each meter. Um, and so if we're talking about five or six watts per square meter radiator forcing, it seems like not very much. But we actually think it's an important driver of now river flood reduction or suppression. And if you, you map that onto societal events, which we've done in several papers now, um, for example, revolts, um, pretty serious periods of social unrest, they sort of line up. This is just visually, of course, presented, but there's we've done a lot of statistical work on this too. There is a pretty good relationship between volcanic eruptions, now river flood suppression, uh, and periods of social unrest for a variety of reasons, I think. Um, and we can do that now pretty much year by year and decade by decade, a paper we've just published uh, with a series of four eruptions in the 160s BC. Um, here it is again, um, notionally, um, and here it is in a climate model with solar radiation um, reduction, four eruptions, a really large one, and then three smaller ones in succession, we think had a decadal level of uh, effect on Egyptian civilization with things like grain prices, um, less crops, less water in the fields, less crops being grown, less food available is would be um, one mechanism we're we're sort of thinking about. Um, so that you know we can do pretty fine grain work with a lot more work to think about. I think um, there are famous climate events in world history that are on larger scale, centennial scale, century scale kinds of events. One of them famously called the medieval climate anomaly now, the MCA. It used to be called the medieval climate optimum. Um, and you can see it here. Um, I hope you can see my arrow. It's, it's here. The trend is a uh, slight warming there um, over a couple of centuries. That's the trend. Um, which looks like it has some, some consequences. We think warming and expansion of civilization seem to go hand in hand very often um, in history, for example. It's called the optimum, it used to be called the optimum, by the way, because it was in a way Eurocentric. Um, Europe does better um, from 900 to around um, 1200 in this kind of warming phase. Um, it's a couple of degrees warmer on average in the summer months, which is a significant change. But it's not optimal everywhere in the world. We now know, hence the hence the name change um, to um, to anomaly because it is um, a signal in the climate proxy records in lots of places. Um, you can see here, for example, in this reconstruction from ice cores, uh, volcanic eruptions from 500 BC minus 500 all the way um, to um, the 20th century, all the big eruptions. Um, with some of the largest ones with dates tied to uh, a tree ring database, which is really good because tree rings are also annual. Um, and this really shows us that the cool reflected in the tree rings and the date and the dates of eruptions and the impact from volcanic eruptions are now from this 2015 paper absolutely um, tied together with um, a year uh, m margin of error, um, you know, honestly, but it's a bit under that these days. So it's a really tight record, but we know the medieval climate uh, anomaly uh, 
um, is probably due to a combination of climate drivers. One of them is a fairly quiescent period um, of volcanic eruptions, which by the way, we're living in at the moment because Pinatubo has been the last one, but also um, a grand solar maximum um, later in the, that anomaly. So um, again, um, a driver of some slight warming, um, probably. We know the North Atlantic is considerably warmer. The ocean temperatures are, are warmer um, at the surface from various climate pro proxy records that have been studied. Um, and it's also the period of Viking expansion um, from the homeland, as it were, um, into um, initially the west coast of Iceland and then the other parts of Iceland and into um, the, the Greenland foundations later and after um, 1,000, 1,100 or so um, AD. So that connection, um, I think, is a really important kind of macro historical, uh, um, a nice connection between the warming trend that, that's really clear um, and um, Viking expansion and, and agriculture that was found. It doesn't last very long, but it becomes uh, better for agriculture um, in Greenland, especially in the West um, and in um, Iceland um, along the coast. So at centennial scales, this is the kind of thing um, that we see um, with, with warming, um, but it's not good everywhere. Um, and so in the same period, a bit at the tail end of the medieval climate anomaly in Chaco Canyon um, in the, the American Southwest um, from tree rings again, um, around here, um, a very serious um, drought um, beginning in the 12th century leads to um, pretty serious abandonment of many sites in northern um, Arizona, Chaco Canyon, in, including the Pueblo culture, um, is abandoned. And we know people actually just move out from um, this area, from the agriculture, where it was very beneficial, great rainfall before, um, to then none, um, and people no surprise, kind of kind of move out of these regions, which is generally considered um, collapse, a rather dramatic term, but it's certainly site abandonment uh, and pretty clearly demonstrated with local um, tree rings. This is one of the early climate history case studies from the University of Arizona Tree Ring Lab, but it's been very well studied archaeologically um, as well. Here you can see kind of the movement of peoples um, southward um, with the drought, and, and again, um, with um, soil moisture reconstructs it from tree rings pretty well shows um, that in um, the original Pueblo areas, it gets really, um, really too dry for human um, habitation. Um, and the same goes in the same period. Um, again, another indication that it's not fully global, but the medieval climate anomaly is certainly documented in a lot of places in the world that the, the classical Mayan civilization um, in a sense um, collapses. Um, the core area of Mayan civilization um, just is completely abandoned archeologically now. I think that's pretty well understood. This is kind of a complex model of what um, the consensus is, I think of, of what happens. And it looks like from estimates, 90% population um, drop in the classical Mayan regions of the central Yucatan, that's that's a pretty good description of collapse. Of course, Mayan civilization does not go away. Um, people move, but also the society changes fairly considerably um, in its hierarchy and its social structure um, and, and so on. So in terms of human response, that seems um, that seems pretty clear with the, with the classical Mayan civilization. Um, and again, back to short-term climate forcing um, in volcanoes. So I've talked about uh, many tens of thousands of year kind of orbital forcing changes, centennial scale changes, and then shorter term climate forcing. Um, and the main the main source now is volcanic eruptions um, that are actually, thanks to Michael Siegel and his group in Bern, very well understood, very well modeled, very well constrained um, in terms of the data. Uh, and a paper came out a year ago now of the full Holocene reconstruction of volcanic eruptions and impact um, there's a great historical group that I've, I've been part of, too, that meets with the volcanologists and the climate modelers and the geochemists. Uh, and so and it's just really clear in the last couple of years that it's volcanoes um, over the last 10,000 years that is a major driver of short-term variability. Now, the question there is, 
uh, does short-term variability matter very much um, at, at all? And, and I think, you know, going back to um, Abbott's brilliant work in 1912 and 1913, yeah, I, I think it does in the short um, term, and it actually matters going forward in terms of our own responses to, um, to, to warming. So I think Abbott would really like to have seen these papers that confirm with um, modeling um, that uh, large eruptions do impact um, global climate. It cools the earth. And one of the impacts of that um, is uh, that it's wetter in some parts of the world um, than, it, than the prior state, for sure. Um, but the monsoon regions um, are um, seriously um, impacted. Um, and we know that in East Africa, the driver of the Nile River um, is seriously impacted by um, by uh, really large scale um, eruptions. Um, and again, just to remind us that uh, the kind of, well, 44 BC, for example, people would think, ah, that must be um, uh, Mount Etna in Sicily. We know Mount Etna from classical sources is erupting in 44 BC, um, but not really significantly to an impact global climate. Uh, in a paper we just published a year ago now, we've identified the volcano in Alaska, and it's dated to the winter of 43 BC. So already this famous paper has to be revised um, by year, and we can date um, the eruption to January, February of 43 BC, which is pretty spectacular. And we can fingerprint, we can fingerprint the exact volcano, um, which is as far back as we can go now with fingerprinting volcanoes. This one, 426 BC, um, with massive climate forcing is still unidentified, for example. Um, and I can't wait for that one to be identified because it's it's the largest volcanic eruption in, in human history um, that's actually referred to by the Greek historian Thucydides, at least indirectly, kind of interesting, in the middle of the Peloponnesian War. Um, a lot more work to do on this, but this kind of the reconstruction now is is really good. It's really constrained. And now the question is, how do we understand um, the impacts of of these things on annual scale? The kind of stuff I've done, you know, God, 20 years ago, looking at historical records. The nice thing about Egypt, again, is we have tens of thousands of written records written in Egyptian on the left, written in Greek on the right. They're often dated to a specific day. There are contracts, land sales, land leases, tax receipts, administrative letters, land surveys. Um, all sorts of other kinds of agreements, um, very specifically dated, which we've now here at Yale with our project have coded. Um, we have a, a great historical database now of, of historical records that eventually we'll make public that we're using now um, in our work. And it's really, it's really rather exciting stuff because we can tie those ancient records to among the best historical climate records we have in the world which is also in Egypt, which is the Cairo Nilometer record um, at Rhoda Island, which begins in 622 AD. And that's an annual record of the Nile River high and low stands, which is pretty amazing. And you can see here from this record, the Nile variability year by year. There is natural variability in Nile River flooding, but our work has already shown that the lowest, the lowest flows our volcanic um, impacts, um, which is really rather uh, remarkable. And we can show that um, pretty pretty carefully. So this record now is a great historical record of now river variability, which is actually a record of the East African monsoon, which is really exciting. So it's a 1300 year record annual back to 622 AD, which we're tying through hydrological modeling, more on that in conversation, hopefully, um, to, um, to this record. And we can hopefully understand um, at least back to 500 BC, the connection between now river flood um, behavior and human responses, sometimes actually really good responses um, to this um, to this record. This is a statistical visualization of the impact in the volcanic year of now river flood suppression based on the Cairo um, record. Um, pretty dramatic in a volcanic year, the now, now river flooding is, is suppressed um, by a considerable amount, really, on uh, over 1,300 year record, 25 centimeters reduction. Doesn't sound like a lot again, but over the 1,300 year record, the mean reduction, that's a pretty considerable reduction. And now we're 
isolating individual eruptions. Um, and it's much more direct, dramatic flood suppression that we can see um, year by year and sometimes pretty dramatic and rather important years um, historically. Again, this is sort of what we're doing here, kind of year by year now, uh, fairly precise. And with hydrological modeling, which has gotten pretty amazing, we can take our historical record, the Chiron Ilometer record, a, a very detailed topographical um, uh, chart map of the Nile River Basin. Yes, it's modern data, um, but we, we've also mapped all historical um, towns and villages in Egypt from the papyri from 300 BC to about 300 AD. Um, and the ancient record um, and the modern flood data record are kind of remarkable. You see here that ancient sites are on higher lying ground, which is, of course, what you'd expect in a floodplain. The, the Egyptians um, were very intelligent, but it's remarkable. We were surprised by this, but the ancient data is still reflecting the uh, this topography of the Nile River floodplain. And we can now hopefully model year by year the water on the floodplain and really understand um, human responses to it in a particular place in Egypt back to, let's say, at about 270 BC with historical records. And sometimes, of course, just standard humanistic work, the papyri give us amazing letters about what's going on in the 160s, which we know, as I mentioned, have has four fairly large eruptions. We know there's now flood problems for sure in these in that decade, in those years. And sometimes we have really touching letters, in this case, a letter to a husband from a wife, basically saying, where the hell are you? Um, we are suffering here. We're not able to eat because of the, the extremity owing to the price of wheat. Um, and we need you home. Um, now we understand historically um, what's happening now, river flood suppression um, and grain price spikes, obviously food shortages, it looks like, and all sorts of other things happening in a very momentous decade uh, in Eastern Mediterranean um, history. Again, we can do that now um, in the 160s BC for a decade. We can do that after the Okmuk eruption here um, in a paper we've published, kind of looking at volcanic eruptions. Um, and um, from tree ring records, we can show the impact of this eruption here over a decade. It creates the fourth coldest decade in human history um, and initially the second coldest year in human history. But there's cooling before the uh, eruption, perhaps natural variability. We have another eruption um, just before the, the large um, eruption and also natural variability of the flood. Um, so what we think is happening is shocks to a, from a very large eruption to the Nile River, but also on top of natural variability of the river from an El Nino year or from other some other natural phenomenon that um, is not so easy to understand. But what we're doing, Lauren mentioned complexity, what we're doing is understanding historical um, complexity. All right, just let me conclude here to get to the conversation. Um, my view of all of this as an historian is, yes, we need to understand um, societies as complex adaptive systems. That is new, certainly in pre-modern history. Um, and indeed, ancient societies are very complex, not as complex as modern ones, but still that complexity is important for us going forward. The loss of complexity um, in, in what is one response to, uh, to major climate changes, particularly centennial scale um, changes, which means the loss of adaptive capacity, which is really important. Um, climate mitigation, technological response, we can see that in the ancient record. We can see that in the medieval record. Clearly, there are responses, often very good responses to the climate changes we see historically, by the way. Uh, and we also see movement um, or migration of people and animals, as we saw with um, the Green Sahara to the Desert Sahara, but in many other cases, humans and animals move um, where there's significant climatic change, particularly at decadal and centennial scales or, or, or more, which had consequences for human civilization as far back as there was civilization. It certainly has consequences for us. There's a concept I like, which kind of expresses this called panarchy. There's the website, which I can provide you um, if, if, uh, if you write me or, or something, um, which is basically arguing for understanding across different scales um, and across um, human scales of complexity in societies as well as climate scales, uh, what happens with climate responses of, of various kinds. So 
Um, it, it's a nice concept, if, if a kind of an awkward word, about how we have to work in understanding the interaction of environment, environmental changes in human societies. History matters. That's the basic argument of my book, um, I think. But um, we can't just apply um, history directly. For example, an ancient Egyptian climate story would have very little to say to a modern Egyptian environmental um, change story because of the boundary conditions, what climate scientists call boundary conditions, have changed fundamentally as society has changed fundamentally. So we just can't apply in a particular place climate change to now that same place, if you see my my um, my meaning. But I think more broadly, we can understand human response to the climate change um, broadly, uh, more generally, what are the kinds of changes, the kinds of responses. What I think we need going forward is much more detailed case studies, place by place, as far back as we can go, which gives us a, a richer understanding of human environmental interactions than we have now, rather than just 100 years, we can go back now, um, at least a few thousand years, uh, and that'll be important. Nonlinear complex system behavior requires deep time scales. This applies to to uh, the last ten thousand years for sure. It applies to us today going forward. Um, around things like how do we assess catastrophic risk as opposed to smaller scale risk in a particular um, place? How do we understand time scale um, changes? Changes that we can't actually observe or experience ourselves as individual human beings. How do we understand, how do we react to such things as individuals or as societies? And as the climate record reminds us, what about abrupt changes which do happen in the deep past um, and that might happen again, rather than kind of slower moving um, changes? And one last thing about policy, uh, this stuff does have policy implications. One of them is geoengineering which is one of these, in case of emergency break glass responses, we can geoengineer the atmosphere to reduce solar radiation um, that will cool the earth. That is quite possible to do. And uh, you can be sure lots of militaries already have this um, in their um, arsenal, a little bit scary, um, and a lot of advocates for this. We already have shown, I think, in our own work here that mimicking volcanic eruptions, which is what geoengineering does to reflect solar radiation back into space, has serious consequences um, around the world, and especially in monsoon areas of the world, which is where 70% of the global population um, lives. And so we ought at least consider history and what we know about um, volcanic impacts on monsoon regions, um, that this would have serious unintended consequences for many people um, in the world um, we need to think kind of globally about um, such things. I will stop there. And I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Professor Manning. I um, personally feel like I'd like to go back and watch that presentation at least three more times. It was oh so brother. dense. There was a ton of stuff in it. I imagine that some of you probably feel the same way. And the good news is that this presentation is being recorded and you can come back and watch it later. It will be available on the Alumni Academy website. So if like me, you wanted to uh, go deep and unpack some of those charts and graphs that we saw, you will definitely have the opportunity to do that later. And and Professor, are, do you feel comfortable sharing your slides with us if people wanted to download a PDF of your slides? Would that be Absolutely. something we could do? Great, so we will post the slides on the Alumni Academy website as well so that people can download them. Um, we do have some questions already teed up. Uh, I, I want to, before we go to questions, um, just remind everyone, if you would like to uh, post a question, please do that in the Q&A and not in the chat. And I want to give a shout out to Douglas, who spent a summer in Katmai and also Akmok and Unak. Did I say that correctly? Unak Island? Umnak. Fantastic. Umnak. Yeah, so you had asked if, if if anybody had been there, and I knew that if we get a crowd of 200 plus Yaleys together, someone has been there. And so um, congratulations to Douglas for winning I'm that. I'm dying prize. to go there. The weather's horrible, <laughs> right, Douglas? But I, I'm dying to actually, we're trying to get there next summer, Joe McConnell and me. Um, anyway, cool. <laughs> awesome. 
Um, so uh, I'm going to start with David's question because it's it's sort of I think it's the question that is sort of in the back of everyone's mind about climate change, and it's it's a rational thought, but it's not it's an irrational thought as well. Um, but I think it's worth getting your point of view on and speaking to before we go um, into the more the more nuanced points about your talk. David wants to know, will climate change by humans be the great filter that ends humanity? Wow, that's wow. <laughs> um, I gave you a preference. That's that's a big one. Um, so should I keep sharing my screen, by the way, or? Uh, no, I think if you stop sharing screen, that's I great. stop share. OK, mm -hmm. so Douglas. Yeah, I mean, so that is. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, that's the worry. So in my book, uh, my, the, my basic, I have two basic elevator kind of arguments. One, I'm, I'm optimistic about the future. Um, and, and two, um, um, what, was it, what was my second one? Gosh, I, now I'm, um, yeah, uh, history matters. That, that's the other one. So uh, the human experiences, I think, inform to some extent um, but we have to make the we have to make the argument. I, I had one last slide I didn't show actually, which shows the danger. Of some of our work it gets picked up in the media, even in in papers that cover climate change very well, like the Manchester Guardian, who kind of over, over -drama dramatize. You know, a volcano kills Cleopatra and ends the Roman Republic, um, which is not what we say. Um, it, that's a very climate determinist um, kind of argument. No, I I, I think. Um, we have a lot of work to do uh, as individuals, of course, but more importantly, as as a society. And the problem is, it's a global problem, um, and it's hard to coordinate. Um, and so, that's the thing. And it's you know, uh, and that's what the COP meetings, I guess, do. A lot of talk, but we need action, of course, uh, which is very tricky. Um, and I think you know, we can't rely on our politicians um, anywhere because I think. Um, uh, that's just uh, the solutions are, are too slow in some way. So no, I no, I, I don't think so. Um, but uh, and I'm not a dooms a doomsday guy because um, I don't like doomsday um, kinds of books because it freezes people and and nothing happens. And um, you know the the debate the great the great debate is uh, on energy and carbon and um, CO two and methane in particular and the climate sensitivity. And how much warmer are we going to get? And what will that do to climate variability? Um, let alone livability in certain parts of the of the earth, which are already getting pretty close to unlivable. I'm thinking of the Persian Gulf, especially um, in the summer, which is unlivable um, given the temperatures there. So no, I, I I think we can't do. I think if we do nothing and burn it the rate we're doing, I, I think we could easily be in some serious trouble around this the idea of tipping points, which is one of the great debates and um, abrupt abrupt change where we can't do anything then once we're in a new climate regime you know i mean exiting the holocene whether the the anthropocene is real or not once we exit the climate regime we're in then it's kind of it's very hard um, and it's very hard to do anything with um, it, with a new re regime i don't think we're quite there yet so we can't do nothing um, but i'm i'm optimistic um, that given I, with a lot of solutions, which we can talk about, uh, you know, which I'm, I'm reading about myself and learning about, um, which are exciting technological solutions, but I don't think we can rely on fully, but I think there's a lot of great ones coming. I think there's, uh, you know, rather than saying capitalism is the cause and therefore we get rid of capitalism. I'm on the side of, to be honest, uh, of, um, um, some investment, bankers uh, like Ed Wellington, um, who talk about investment of capital at big scale, um, has some serious promise in terms of um, getting things done. So I think there's a lot of different things we can do um, as societies and as individuals. Um, and I, we already have done quite a bit with more to go. So we could talk all, all night uh, around a bottle of wine about, about that question, of course. Um, it, it deserves, uh, you know, a major conversation by itself. Well, it, Ruth complicates the question a bit more by saying the earth has never held 8 billion people before, 8 billion. Yeah, and um, it, and can a warming earth really support that many people with aquifers drying up, with lakes and rivers disappearing, et cetera? 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I want to throw on the back of her question, one that I know will come up in people's minds, which is you mentioned some ideas for solutions that you think are out there that are good. So I wonder if you could, um, you know, speak to maybe your top, top three ideas, and maybe they fall into the category of one technological solution that you think is really interesting, a political solution that you think is really interesting, and a scientific uh, climate action type solution that you think is interesting. Yeah, that's, wow. Uh, I'm thinking- Just a little, just a little question. Yeah, <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, the, yeah, so the caring, what, what is the caring capacity of the earth um, is a hugely important question um, and also important for, for, for carbon reduction. You know, I think, I think Vaclav Smeal, I think Bill Gates also reflects this in, in his book, you know, um, carbon reduction, um, we're going to do a little bit more, but we're not going to reduce to zero anytime soon. Uh, so um, because of basic constraints around uh, nitrogen fertilizer um, needs and and cement um, around the world and, you know, places like Africa, we can't tell Africa, sorry, no fertilizer for you. Um, you know, so, I mean, there are practical constraints of what we can do in terms of um, carbon emissions, um, I think. I think there are Technical technical solutions about carbon capture, a lot of them that look really um, exciting. There's a lot of things that one can do locally, like just like rain barrel technology. There's a really interesting Mexican company that's doing really great, has really great um, ideas there, for example, that, I, that I've seen. So that's just that's just individuals um, and very easy fixes if, you, if you're living in the West, um, which is going to be dry. <laughs> And you, for some reason, you want to keep your lawn or your golf course. I think there are, there are practical solutions there besides um, tapping um, ancient aquifers. That's that's for sure. The political solutions at a global scale are, I, I think, much, much harder. Um, and, you know, I think um, there's conversation in the, the Copenhagen group, which is mainly economists, but others, too, around around cost benefit analysis of what what are things we can do that are that are. Um, that are cost effective as opposed to cost prohibitive rather than thinking we need to do all these things like right now um, or otherwise we're doomed. I think that Copenhagen group lists a lot of very practical things that can be done um, that are that are reasonably cost effective. And I, th- I would recommend, I can find the link to that. I would recommend looking at that. It's a bit controversial. Again, the economic solutions um, sometimes um, are, are resisted for emotional reasons and other reasons too, I think. But um, I think there are some good things uh, that these that this group is is proposing. Um, I think one of the issues from a h- historical point of view is that, you know, a lot of the changes societally in the response are are good changes. Te- there's some technical responses and or movement, um, uh, political reconfiguration, um, reinventing, um, even changes in governance and so on. Um, th- that are kind of natural solutions. But now we're in a place where um, Either we're going to have sort of natural changes imposed on us, or we we have to re- really think about what kinds of changes at what scale will be acceptable to people. Um, we need to have that conversation because I think it's coming in the next century. Um, so, how much change? What kind of change um, would be acceptable? What about migration? Um, how much migration? You know, I I think population estimates are most lots of places in the world have population decreases in, in the developed world, for example. I think we might hit a point where overall population will level off and decline um, before we hit 9 billion. That's the projection I think I've seen. But still, um, that questionnaire is right, that that is a major difference between um, our, our condition um, and, you know, the, the Roman world that yeah. of our of our human ancestors um yeah it, it, yeah it, exactly you know um in the in the Roman world the, the globe had something like 125 million people in it the world <laughs> yeah totally um, different composition uh, so we are in it we are you know that's important uh, the demographic constraints are hugely important um and, as well as mi- the migratory solutions um keeping people in place um or not, you know, there might be some ex- exciting things happen. Um, people moving out of uh, west of the Rockies um, into um, water areas like the upper Midwest, the Great Lakes region. You could argue that Buffalo might do really well. Okay, the, the snow and the cold, colder. But Pittsburgh you know, is apparently a great deal these days. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, uh, 
I mean, Anchorage is already, okay, you have to deal with the dark, but Anchorage, our Alaskan friends might say that Anchorage is, you know, there are Californians and Seattle people moving to Anchorage, you know, so it's already sort of happening, um, you know, at, at individual scale, but what's acceptable at, at a country scale um, or at a continent scale of movement from South and Central America into North America? We are, we already see that as a massive political issue. How are we responding to that in a in a meaningful way, not in an emotional way, um, around you know serious political solutions, which I think we can understand and put on the table, and yet not happening um, in uh, in in Washington for sure. Um, so, um, and what was the? So I, I'm not sure what to propose in political solution. I think that's this is really a challenge, um, not only in the country but but globally. How do you respond? Um, to to China and and Chinese growth, how much how much real growth is possible? Can we really tell Yale college students now, which is sort of I think what we have to do, that the kind of real growth that you expect, let's say quarterly, three or four percent, um, the living standards and so on, those might those might drop a little bit, um, and um, even if we mitigate seriously, we might see living standards changing a bit. Um, and we might not see the impact of mitigation until 2070, 2080, till you know, till their grandkids are are older. That's the tough conversation um, that that you that has to be had. You know, what's acceptable, um, what's not acceptable is uh, um, putting your head in the sand um, about things. I think you know. We have to have conversations at all sorts of levels. Um, this is a, hopefully a good one here. Uh, and then um, what was the other solution? I had asked about a, a technical uh, uh, innovation that you think would be interesting, but I'm going to I'm going to yeah. add a nuance to that question because there was someone who who asked about whether we um, whether there's a way to sort of instigate a volcanic eruption to drive global cooling and whether that would be a good idea. And I'm sorry that I'm, I'm butchering your question because I cannot find it right now, Yeah, say, but it was along those lines. Oh, okay. So uh, the Yosemite volcano, we can just forget about because if that erupts, um, that is an extinction event. Um, and you know, there may be some humans that get through that bottleneck, but not many of us, and we can't worry about it. <laughs> so the, for a super volcano, um, on the scale of 600,000 years, Yellowstone. Um, and, you know, there are some, there's some movement in that caldera. Um, we don't think about that because that we can't, we don't have the technology to respond to it um, unless we colonize Mars very quickly. Um, no, I, not, as far as I know, no, but one of the impacts of um, polar ice melting, which is melting pretty rapidly and non-linearly um, is that we see historically with ice ages that when the pressure of ice caps comes off of volcanoes, let's say in Iceland, um, you get much greater volcanic activity. That's that is clear in the in the his, uh, the climate record. Um, so I mean, arguably, um, Iceland will be the place. They have some pretty nasty volcanoes there. Um, one of which Hecla is overdue, in fact, for an eruption, and you know. That's a year or two eruption. Um, you know, one of the reasons geoengineering seems like a bad idea to me is um, that what happens if you geoengineer the atmosphere and then you have a, a series of eruptions, which are, are not fully predictable, which will compound um, the cooling, let alone get rid of blue skies, like today in New Haven, you know, beautiful day, although unusual weather to be sure. But I like my skies blue, not brown. So as far as I know, uh, I don't think we can uh, encourage volcano, but if we keep melting ice, I think um, the the uh, climate scientists will, will tell us um, likely to have more volcanic activity from Iceland, from um, Alaska, which are which have huge volcanoes, not fully understood by the way historically, um, or Kamchatka Peninsula in. Uh, in uh, in Russia, and th those are large volcanic eruptions in the northern hemisphere that impact global climate pretty significantly. Okay, so we have a lot of questions, most of them really excellent questions. Um, and so I'm, I'm apologizing in advance if I don't get to your question. 
they, they fall into sort of two categories. So there are people who want to interrogate the climate science information. And then there are people who want to interrogate sort of the anthropology side of what we, you know, historical anthropology side of what we've learned wow. from your talk. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to give a balance um, back and forth between them. I want to go to Robert's question. Um, are the orbital variables affecting climate precise enough to predict when the next glaciation would occur if one discounts human climate modification? <laughs> that's, a, wow, that's a very specific, great question. And yeah, so the ice ages are, are not, far, my understanding as an historian who works a lot with climate scientists, I, I read a lot, but my understanding is there, there, there is a periodicity to the ice ages. Um, it's not precise. Uh, it is, there's some variability there. Um, I think we've understood, I think we well documented. So um, from Antarctica, we can drill down now and we've got 800,000 years of climate record. That's as far back in Earth's history as we can go. The The goal is to get 1 million year ice, um, which I think is uh, going on right now. But that's a constraint for Earth, Earth's climate history. We can under, We can understand at some scale of accuracy and further back, there's more margin of error for sure. Um, a million years. And I think we have, I think we can understand five ice age, ice age cycles, I believe. Um, so that's pretty well, I think it's pretty well understood. It's what's so, what's also under, I think, gosh, um, I forget when the prediction was naturally when we'd have the next ice age. It's tens of thousands of years from now. Um, and clearly we're, we're postponing that. Now, is that a good or a bad thing? You can argue both ways. You know, I, I certainly talk to people who don't like the, the climate arguments and say, well, but we can we can grow v uh, vineyards in uh, in Sweden now. Great. Um, OK. I mean, you know, there are winners and losers in climate change historically. That seems sure. And there's um, an increase in um, inequality and all sorts of things, which we can understand a little bit um, in the ancient record. Um, but it, that seems to be there and uh, arguably that would be um, a, a important impact of what's happening right now. Uh, th there'll be winners and losers. It's not all losers unless uh, the Yellowstone caldera decides to erupt. And then most of us are, are the earth is, well, the earth will win eventually, but um, living things um, less so. So yeah, we're, we are postponing the, the next ice age. I think that's clear. Um, I forget by how long, but I, but I think by uh, considerable ways. Um, and I think I've re read recently that there are some climate models, and, and this is on the level of climate modeling, which by the way, in the next iteration this year is way better than the last iteration of climate models, the ensemble of models, because there's more specific climate data in it. So models are getting better um, with their models, more precise. Um, it's not perfect. Um, but, but I think uh, we're, we might be postponing the next ice age permanently. Wow, that's, yeah, that's, um, which, that's which, saying a lot. Which, which is saying that there's unknowns there. And, and here's, here's the bottom line, just really quickly. There's still unknowns in climate science. There's still unknowns in understanding human societies, even modern ones. It's complex uh, and we don't understand everything. Um, and there's uncertainties with human history. There's uncertainties in climate data for sure. My default position is always with uncertainties, we should probably tread light on the earth um, and not go wild. That's that's a personal belief um, that's documented in Native American society, speaking of anthropology, for example, very well, um, that uh, we're protected by Mother Earth, um, and we really should, in a sustainable way, treat it, tread lightly on it, um, just as a Or default. start being really, really nice to Mars. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, I actually like Earth. I actually like living in Connecticut, <laughs> actually. So, you know, <laughs> Um, if you want to go to Mars, hello, Elon, um, you know, <laughs> great, but, um, <laughs> well, I, um, I want to follow that up with a question from Stephanie, uh, who says we look forward to your book. I very much agree, Stephanie. And I want to thank everybody in the chat who's adding to this conversation. Um, Professor Manning, you've mentioned a few links that you would post and quoted a few things and people have posted those links in the chat for us already. So that's fantastic. Thank you all for doing that. Um, Stephanie says, does the current buildup of greenhouse gases and man-made changes make the historic changes over time look smaller or more minor than before? 
or will those changes combine? So the, the man-made changes and the historic changes sort of combine to be even more catastrophic. And I think it, I think it's sort of looking backwards to what you just said with this question. Um, but I, I think it's an interesting point to consider. Yeah, it's great. Um, great. Thank you again. God, these questions. I love Yale. <laughs> um, such smart questions, very thoughtful questions. Um, thank you. Um, so, yeah. Um, I, I, so, you know, the earth has been warmer before. Um, there has been more CO2 concentration in the atmosphere than, than now. Um, but we as an animal species weren't around. Um, so, um, you know, if you, if you care about earth history, you can see like really massive warming or snowball earth um you know what the earth the history of earth's climate is spectacular as far as we understand it and the, the wild changes from snowball earth to extremely warm conditions um we we emerged uh well uh you know uh there's the climate change argument for out of africa um for sure and the human species um, um itself read john brooke um climate change um, um, a rough journey. Um, the second edition is coming out, I think, next year. But it's a it, it tells the macro story of Earth's history and climate change. Yeah. So uh, the the thing is about warming, which we can measure now um, pretty precisely, is the rapidity of the warming, which, which is clearly a human signal by and large, not 100, percent but it, it's it's mainly us. Um, and the rapidity of the warming we haven't experienced before. Um, so talk about abrupt. Um, it's it, it. We are changing quickly with kind of unknown consequences, really. And one of them is this: what about variability? There may be less less climate variability um, in the future as a result of this, which is interesting. But um, there are other kind of consequences, um, not so well understood. I, I don't think so. Yeah, um, we're kind of, um, in a way, history doesn't inform us about human beings and responses to this sort of um, rapidity, um, in, in this case of warming. Um, and historically in the past, the real negative changes have been cooling events, um, all, almost always tied to disease outbreaks, by the way. Oh, um, very interesting. Yeah, so you know, so the warming is kind of, um, like the, 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 we saw with the medieval climate optimum or the anomaly, it's warmer in Europe, it's warmer in the North Atlantic, that seems to be better for societies there, but in the desert Southwest, people move, abandon Chaco Canyon, um, and um, the Maya respond, but with significant societal changes there. Um, well, I'm, so, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, in a way it's new, um, I, I, I would say. Um, yeah, I, we, we had a presentation by Paul Turner, um, and during our last climate change conversations oh, last year, and he talked about what yeah. would a virologist say about climate change. And he, he talked about how the warming creates an opportunity for mosquito borne illness, for example, yeah. to because of the nighttime temperatures allowing uh, larvae of different insects to germinate in ways that they couldn't when the temperature grows mm -hmm. cold during the winter, et cetera. And that we have no idea what that would do for disease you know for global disease um outcomes yeah so it's, it's the what you know goes with the point that you're making if people want to watch that recording it is available on our website and we'll link it to this presentation so they can look at the two together oh that's fantastic yeah no it, it's clear and sometimes we don't know in, in history one of the things we don't know is with drought now um you, you also see correlated um dysentery mm -hmm. um, people are drinking crappy water um, because they have to. Now, I'm sure that happened in antiquity. Um, this kind of, but it's very hard to see in the historical record, for example. Um, so it's one of these kind of blanks in the historical analysis um, that we sort of, we maybe we can assume, um, but, you know, it's kind of dangerous to assume, but I'm pretty sure it's, it, it would be there. People are drinking um, not great um, waters um, sometimes in, in cases of, uh, of large-scale droughts. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I want to. I'm glad that you're mentioning the historical record because I want to use that as a chance to switch over to some of the questions about the more the anthropological side, historical side. Um, and I'm going to use CS's question as a way to transition. CS is at the COP27 um, meeting right now in Egypt, uh, so very fitting to the presentation that you've given. Um, and 
says the regime of the Nile, uh, which you've studied so much, will be greatly impacted by the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, with no agreements yet in place about water sharing in Sudan and Egypt. Um, can your work have an impact on policy decisions about human activity? And also ask the question of, you know, looking at historically how human societies have taken initiatives. So that, that's an example of one initiative. But one CS is wondering if you've looked historically at how human societies have taken initiatives when faced with climate changes. Yeah. 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 I think we had there's some decent evidence historically. You know, the success of our species is cooperation. Full stop, end of paragraph. Um, and uh, at the minute, I, I don't feel like a lot of cooperation, even driving down 95 to Yale campus, there's like not a lot of cooperation. So we got to be careful. Uh, it's, it's, it's important. Uh, it's harder to coordinate at global scales now um, than it was in, in these smaller societies. But um, on the on the GERD, on the Ethiopian Dam, yeah, um, major problem. You know, interestingly, um, we, we worked on that a little bit. Um, just thinking about it, um, if you look at the impact reports, including the climatology reports on the impact of the of that dam, there's no reference to volcanic eruptions, <laughs> which kind of surprised us. Going, okay, this is a, this, a sensitive area to uh, to eruptions, um, and so you'd think uh, that should be built into the kind of resiliency. What happens if um, you get the reduction of uh, of rainfall, reduction of uh, of water? Um, it surely shifts now the 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 control of the river from Egypt uh, and the Sudan to Ethiopia in a pretty unstable political regime. Um, that is uh, slightly frightening, and you know the, there's a cooperation of I think it's 15 East African countries around Nile River. You know cooperation is you know I think there are kind of agreements, but I think there's still uh, you know broadly on paper, but when push comes to shove, uh, that's when um, serious problems could happen, I, I, I think, in that region, which is a you know populous region. Um, so ag agreements on paper kind of go away. And then um, and then what happens? Does the dam get bombed um, uh, or uh, or exactly, um, you know, what what is the solution there? I mean, it's, it, it's a very tough one, I, I, I think. I don't have great answers to it, uh, cooperation, maybe um, external pressure. Um, a way of sharing water is gonna be really important. Um, water in general is gonna be really important um, in the American West, in Australia, in the Southern hemisphere generally. Um, it looks like a, a very serious issue across the board. How do we figure out um, these um, sort of at scale cooperation um, agreements? I, we're gonna, Unless we ignore it as a particular country, we as a people are going to have to be involved. We're going to have to be more globally involved um, in these sort of things. I'm not sure that answers CS's question. I might know you, CS. Um, I don't know, but um, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's a um, you know of all things we need. Um, that's one, and you know it's, it's, there's some uncertainty about it. I think the prediction, the climate models uh, predict East Africa being wetter, the Indian the the Indian Ocean broadly a monsoon being stronger under warming conditions. Um, but then you think of um, places like Bangladesh that will be underwater um, and people will, a lot of people are gonna have to move. Um, so these things are being thought about, I think, but, um, but you know, by planners in, in some way in some back government offices, but these things will certainly happen. Um, well, if you, you, you're speaking about people having to move, and I think I'm going to put the last question to Emmanuel, um, who wants to know uh, if if there is a particular chapter in your upcoming book that would be used to look at what history has to teach us about climate and migration, and if that's something that you're going to discuss. Yeah. Uh, right, and I'm yeah. I'm saying that because obviously we have we have like 20 unanswered questions. So we must have um, you back when you, when you're further <laughs> along with the book. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I have to do, I I've spoken to my editor. It's, it's, it's for live right, by the way, um, part of Norton. Um, so my editor is a great editor saying, well, you know, initially I said, can I just do pre-modern history? <laughs> no, it has to be global. And you have to, you have to cover these hard topics like migration and disease and climate change in the book. 
uh, it has to be kind of broadly appealing. Yes. So I have to, I'm retooling my whole, my whole brain um, and trying to understand these issues. Some of them um, I'm a village idiot coming in and I go to science meetings now a lot and I'm the village idiot asking, asking <laughs> really stupid questions. Unlike you guys asking really learned questions. Uh, that's how, that's how I learned, but yeah, um, I, I will cover it. Um, I have a general chapter um, right now on kind of climate and history and how it's been understood and climate determinism and how we have to really understand it in a much more complicated way. And then I'm doing case studies um, from uh, 10,000 BC um, to um, to the present. Uh, it, it won't be comprehensive. It can't be. It'd be a 20,000 page book. But I'm trying to come up with case studies and kind of my my thought as an historian in this in this complicated world um, and trying to be what's the word. Um, careful about language, not over dramatizing, um, finding language that um, is accurate, um, that reflects some of the uncertainties, which surely exist. It's surely important, but that isn't the reason to ignore all this. It's actually the opposite. I think the reason to really pay attention to it. Anyway, thank you um, for another great question. Well, thank you for this presentation, really thought provoking and excellent information and a different way of looking at climate change, which I think we all appreciate. Um, thank all of you for participating, for posing all the questions, for sticking here with us. Um, if you have questions that weren't answered, I'm really sorry. Please do feel free to email us at alumni, alumni academy at yale.edu um, with any questions or comments that you would like us to pass to Professor Manning. And we have one more um, presentation. So please go to our website, alumniacademy.el.edu to sign on for the last climate change conversation of this series. Um, Professor Manning, any last words that you would like to share with everyone before we sign off? No, uh, this has been wonderful for me. I really appreciate everyone's um, presence um, and, and thoughtfulness um, and engagement. I wish we could do this in person. Um, it would be uh, even more fun. Um, and um, yeah, I'm happy for um, feedback and, um, and you know, critiques and, and ideas as I write this thing. It, that's always great. So I, I just say um, thank you. Thank you. Grateful for the opportunity. Um, hope to meet some of you um, on campus or somewhere else in a lecture that I'll give later in the year. Be well, everybody. Yes, absolutely. Thank you.